I propose in this lecture uh, to, to um, ask a relatively uh, simple question, one that we might immediately identify as belonging to moral psychology or perhaps moral philosophy, what leads any of us to seek to preserve the life of the other. <clears throat> I'm aware that there are debates about the preservation of life that now inform medical ethics, uh, debates on reproductive freedom and technology, but also healthcare, law enforcement, and prisons. I won't be entering into those debates in detail this evening, though some of what I have to say may well have implications for how we do enter those debates. I want rather to point out a feature of debates about when and where the preservation of life is called for, um, and to suggest that we invariably make some assumptions about what counts as life, not only when and where it begins or how it ought to end, but also perhaps in another register, the question of whose lives count as living. So when we ask the question why we seek to preserve the life of the other, we could be asking about <clears throat> what motivates us to do so, or we could be asking about what justifies actions of that kind, or indeed what establishes refusing or failing to preserve a life as morally unjustifiable. The first question is psychological, though clearly a question of moral psychology, and the second belongs to moral philosophy or to ethics, fields that sometimes rely on moral psychology to make their claims. But do these questions also overlap with social theory and political philosophy? Much depends on how we pose the question and what assumptions we make um, when we pose it. For instance, it makes a difference if we pose the question about a singular other person what leads any of us to seek to preserve the life of this other person? That question is, of course, different from asking whether we seek to preserve the lives of some particular group with which we strongly identify, or a vulnerable group that seems to us in danger of violence or destruction, or indeed, uh, all who are living. Asking what leads us to seek to preserve the life of a particular other person presumes a dyadic relation. You may be someone I know or someone I do not know, but I may, under certain circumstances, be in a position to ward off danger or to stop a destructive force that threatens your life. What do I do and why do I do it and what justifies the action that I finally take? That question seems to belong to the field of moral philosophy and moral psychology, though in no way does it exhaust the range of questions considered by those fields. Asking whether we seek to preserve the life of some particular group, asking what justifies actions of that kind, presumes that we might well call a bio, presumes what we may well call a biopolitical consideration. It not only asks what we consider uh, to count as a life, but whose lives count as worthy of preservation. Under certain conditions, it makes sense to ask whose life counts as a life, even when that formulation seems to founder in tautology. I'll return, perhaps, to this question of biopolitics a bit later, but for now, let us continue to worry about the first question with which I began, what leads any of us to seek to preserve the life of the other? It is a question that in some form has to be asked not just of individuals, but also of institutional arrangements, economic systems, and forms of government what structures and institutions are in place to safeguard the life of a population, or indeed every population. We will turn to psychoanalysis to see what grounds are given there for not taking a life and for seeking to preserve one. It's not a matter of thinking about the relation of individual to group psychology. The two invariably overlap. Even our very singular and subjective dilemmas implicate us in a broader political world. The I and the you, the they and the we are implicated in one another, and those implications are not only logical, they are lived out as ambivalent social bonds, ones that constantly pose the ethical demand to negotiate aggression. So if we start the moral inquiry with the uncritical use of the I, or indeed the we, we have perhaps occluded prior 
and pertinent inquiry that considers how both the singular and plural subject are formed and contested by the relations they seek to negotiate through moral reflection. Who is this we called upon to preserve the lives of others? Who are the others, whether individuals or groups of others, whose lives are apparently in need of preservation? Are the lives of those who ask the question the same as the lives about whom the question is asked? For those of us who pose the question, do we consider that our own lives are also worthy of preservation, and if so, who is called upon to preserve them? Or is it rather that we presume the worthiness of our lives, presume that everything will be done to preserve our lives, such that we ask this question about others who do not live with such presumptions? Is the we really separable from those other lives we may seek to preserve? If there is a we who seeks to solve this problem, and then there are others who are the recipient of our deliberations, do we then assume a certain divide, arguably paternalistic, between those who have the power to preserve life or those for whom there exists a power that seeks already to preserve our lives, and those whose lives are in danger of not being preserved, those for whom power imperils lives and whose lives call to be preserved by a countervailing power. This happens, for instance, when so-called vulnerable groups are identified. On the one hand, the discourse on vulnerable groups or vulnerable populations that has been important to both feminist humans, human rights work and the ethics of care has been, of course, terribly important. If a group is called vulnerable, then it has a claim to protection. And the question then is, to whom is that claim addressed? And which group emerges as charged with the task of protecting the vulnerable? On the other hand, have the ones who bear a responsibility for vulnerable groups become divested of vulnerability through that designating practice? Of course, the point is to highlight the unequal distribution of vulnerability. But if the designation implicitly distinguishes between vulnerable and invulnerable groups, right? If you have a vulnerable group, it seems like you also have an invulnerable group. Um, um, and it seems as well that it charges the invulnerable with the protection of the vulnerable. Does that move not fortify a paternalistic form of power though, and an odd sort of inequality? Those of us who understand ourselves as responding to an ethical claim to preserve life, even to protect life, may find ourselves subscribing to a social hierarchy in which, for ostensibly moral reasons, the vulnerable are distinct from the paternalistically powerful. It is, of course, possible to claim that such a distinction is descriptively true, but when it becomes the basis of a moral reflection, then a social hierarchy is given a moral rationalization, and moral reasoning is pitted against the aspirational norm of a shared or reciprocal condition of equality, even of an equality, uh, an, an equal vulnerability. So, so far in this opening discussion, I've posed a question that focuses on the question of psychological motivations for preserving another's life or the lives of others in the plural. And I've sought to show that such a question, perhaps in spite of itself, opens onto a political problem concerning the management of demographic differences and the ethical ruses of paternalistic forms of power. As of yet, it leaves critically unexplored such key terms such as life, the living, what it means to preserve and to protect, and whether these can be thought as reciprocal actions such that those who potentially preserve the lives of others are potentially also in need of preservation, and that what, what that implies about potentially shared conditions of vulnerability and exposure. My inquiry in, these, in this lecture is meant to ask about the possibility of preserving life against modes of destruction, including the kinds of destruction that we ourselves unleash. My wager is that it's not only that we find ways to preserve the lives that we ourselves have the power to destroy, but also that the preservation of life requires infrastructures organized with that purpose in mind. Of course, there are infrastructures that seek precisely not to preserve lives, so infrastructure alone is not a sufficient condition for the preservation of life. My point is rather that it is not just what we do or refuse to do to preserve a set of lives um, or life, but rather how the world is built such that the infrastructural conditions for the preservation of life are reproduced and strengthened. 
Of course, in some sense, we do build that world, but in another sense, we find ourselves emerging into a built world we never made. The environment, of course, is not fully the result of human making. That limit of anthropocentrism will turn out to be important to developing an ethos of nonviolence. An ethos of nonviolence will turn out also to be different from both moral philosophy and moral psychology, though a consideration of both forms of inquiry takes us to that very insight. When we take moral psychology as a point of departure, as Freud surely did when considering the origins of destructiveness and aggression, our reasoning makes sense only in light of fundamental political structures, including assumptions we make about how destructive potential inheres in any social relationship. Of course, lives appear one way or the other only from specific historical perspectives. They acquire and lose value depending on the framework in which they are regarded, which is not to say that any given framework has the full power to decide the value of a life. But the differential ways in which the value of life is gauged are informed by tacit schemes of valuation according to which lives are deemed to be more or less grievable some achieving iconic dimensions, the absolutely and clearly grievable life, and others barely making a mark, the absolutely ungrievable, a loss that is no loss. And then, of course, there's a vast domain of others whose value is foregrounded within one framework and lost within another, that is, whose value is flickering at best. One could claim that there's a continuum of the grievable, but that framework doesn't let us understand those occasions in which a life is at the same time actively mourned within one community context and fully unmarked and unmarkable within a dominant national or international frame. If there's a normative aspiration of this work, and I will concede it quickly and without shame, I used to be afraid of being normative, it's okay, you can be normative. Um, I, here we go, what is it? To formulate a political imaginary of the radical equality of grievability. If I were to say the radical equality of those who are grievable, I would not be able to focus on the way that grievability is differentially allocated, such that some do not rise to the level of the grievable, cannot be grasped as lives worth mourning, in the same way that we talk about the unequal distribution of goods or resources, I believe that we can also speak about the radically unequal distribution of grievability. That does not mean that there's a center of power that distributes according to a calculus, but it may well mean that a calculus of this sort pervades regimes of power in more or less tacit ways. And though some may think that I'm calling for everyone to cry in the face of another's death, and ask how we might grieve for those we do not even know, I want to suggest that grieving takes a different form, even an impersonal form, when the loss is not proximate, when it is at a distance, or when, in fact, it is nameless. To say that a life is grievable is to claim that a life, way before it is lost, um, is or will be worthy of being grieved should it be lost, and that its loss would be and should be marked as a loss and that the prospect of loss is to be feared, and that an active position to prevent that loss should be cultivated. If institutions were structured according to a principle of the radical equality of grievability, that would mean that every life conceived within those institutional terms would be worth preserving, and that any of those losses would be marked and lamented, and that this would be true not only of this or that life, but of every life. This would, I suggest, have implications for how we think about health care, imprisonment, war, occupation, and citizenship, all of which make distinctions between populations that are more or less grievable. We will perhaps have time to consider in what sense equality is at work in such a formulation. But still, there is that tricky question of life. When life starts, what kinds of living beings I have in mind when I speak about those who are living. Are they subjects? Are they human? Are they embryonic? And so not quite a they at all. And what about insects, animals, and other living organisms? Are they distinct entities? Or are we talking about living processes or relations? I'll enter those thickets, perhaps, in time. 
But for now, I'm simply proposing that the ethic I'm articulating is bound up with a specific political imaginary, an egalitarian imaginary, one that requires a conjectural way of proceeding, a way of experimenting with the conditional. Only lives that would be grieved if they were lost qualify as grievable lives, and these are lives actively and structurally protected from violence and destruction. The use of the grammatical form of the second conditional is one way of experimenting with a potential, postulating what would follow if all lives were regarded as grievable. It might let us see how a utopic horizon opens up in the midst of our consideration of whose lives matter and whose lives do not, or whose, whose lives are more likely to be preserved and whose lives are not. So when I'm talking about grievability, and also I'm not just talking about lives that are already lost, but living, living uh, lives uh, where grievability is, a, is an attribute that is actually born by the living. This life is one that would be grieved if it were lost. For the most part, when we confront moral dilemmas regarding the conditions under which life should be preserved, we formulate hypotheses and then we test them by imagining various scenarios. If I were a Kantian, there, that's a hypothetical, I might ask whether if I act in a certain way, I can without contradiction will that everyone act in that same way or at least in accord with the same moral precept. For Kant, the question is whether one commits a contradiction or acts reasonably in willing as one does. He gives us a negative and a positive formulation of his maxim, I ought never to act except in such a way that I can also will that my maxim should become a universal law. Or here again, in a positive way, act always on that maxim whose universality as a law you can at the same time will. One example he offers is that of the false promise, one that's made to extricate oneself from a difficult situation. That route seems not, seems not to work for, and I quote, I become aware at once that I can indeed will to lie, but I can by no means will a universal law of lying. This is very important for Kafka, by the way. Others, he claims, would pay me back in like coin, and my maxim, as soon as it was made a universal law, would be bound to annul itself. I take it then that I cannot reasonably will that false promising become a universal practice, not simply because I don't like the possibility that I may be lied to. I have to imagine that possibility to understand the contradictory character of the maxim. So for non-Kantians, for consequentialists, the imperative to imagine the consequences of living in a world in which everyone would act as you choose to act leads to the conclusion that some practices are utterly untenable, not because they are irrational or contradictory, but because they inflict consequential damage that is unwanted. In both cases, I would suggest, a potential action is figured as hypothetically reciprocal. One's own act comes back in the imagined form of another's act. Another might act on me as I would act on the other, and the consequences are unacceptable because of those damaging, those damaging results. For Kant, the damage is done to reason, but not for all moral philosophers who engage the hypothetical in this way. The broader question is whether one would want to live in a world in which others acted in the same way that I propose to act when I posit a set of violent acts. Again, we could conclude that it would be irrational to will one thing for myself that I could not possibly will for another, or we might conclude that the world itself would not be livable if others were to act in the way that I propose to act, and then we would be indexing a threshold of livability. In either moral experiment, one imagines a potentially destructive act reciprocated. It is not exactly my act, it is an act that I imagine, an act that I imagine doing, and as such, it has something of me in it, to be sure, but I have assigned it to a possible someone, and so have taken a bit of distance from the act itself, when the act that impresses itself upon me as the potential act of another, I should not really be surprised, since I started by distancing myself from the act that I was considering for myself. If the act is not mine, then whose is it? Thus paranoia begins. My postulation is that such a form of imagining intersects with psychoanalysis and its account of fantasy in some important ways. One's action comes back to one in the form of another's action. 
right? So in a way, Kant, in his hypotheticals, engaging a kind of paranoid method, a method of paranoia. Um, that action um, uh, might be duplicated, or in the case of aggression, it would be figured as emanating from the other and directed against oneself. In scenes of persecutory fantasy, the imagined return of one's own aggression through an external figure is hardly a livable situation. If we ask what links the act of imagining, the reciprocated act within moral philosophy, how would it be if others acted as I did, and the reversals that take place in persecutory fantasy, whose aggression is it that comes back toward me in an external form, could it be my own? We may understand the act of imagining reciprocal action as crucial to an understanding of the ways in which one's own aggression becomes bound up with another's. This is not simply a mirror of projections or a cognitive misfire. Rather, it's a way of thinking about aggression as part of any social bond. If the act that I imagine doing can, in principle, be the one that I also suffer, then there is no way to separate the reflection on individual conduct from the reciprocal relations that constitute social life. This postulation will turn out to be important for the argument I hope to make about the equal grievability of lives. So my suggestion is that the site where moral philosophy is quite radically implicated in psychoanalytic thought is the phantasmatic dimension of substitutability, that one person can be substituted for, one, for another, and that this happens quite often in psychic life. Let me then briefly recast one version of a consequentialist view in light of this thesis. If I contemplate an act of destructiveness and I imagine that others might do as I plan to do, I may end up casting myself as the recipient of that action. That might result in a persecutory fantasy strong enough to dissuade me from acting as I thought I might or surely wished. The thought that others might do as I propose to do or that others might do to me what I propose to do to others proves to be unmanageable. Of course, if I become convinced that I will be persecuted, not realizing that the action I imagine is in part my own imagined action, carrying my own wish, then I might construct a rationale for acting aggressively against an aggression that's clearly coming toward me from the outside. I could use the persecutory phantasm as a justification, hey, for my own acts of persecution. Sounds good. <laughs> This is all the more tragic or comic, depending on your point of view or your mood, when one realizes that it's my own aggression that comes toward me in the form of the other's action and against which I now aggressively seek to defend myself. It is my action, but I assign it to another's name, and as misguided as that substitution may be, it nevertheless compels me to consider what, that what I do can be done to me, I say consider. But this is not always a reflective procedure. Once a substitution becomes subject to fantasy, there are involuntary associations that follow. So though the experiment, the moral experiment, may start quite consciously as a hypothetical, those kinds of substitutions of me for another, of another for me, implicate me in an involuntary set of responses that suggest that the process of substitution, the psychic susceptibility to being substituted for what we might call a primary and transitive mimesis cannot be fully orchestrated or restrained by a deliberate act of mind. In some ways, substitution is prior to the very emergence of the I that I am, operating prior to conscious deliberation. So when I consciously set myself the task of substituting others for me or substituting myself for others, I may well become susceptible to an unconscious domain that undercuts the deliberate character of my experiment. Something is thus experimenting with me in the midst of my experiment. It's not fully under my control. This point will prove to be important to the question of why any of us should seek to preserve the life of the other. Since as I pose the question, it reverses and expands, becoming recast as reciprocal action. As a result, in seeing how my life and the life of the other can be substituted for one another, they seem not to be so fully separable. <clears throat> the links between us exceed any that I may have consciously chosen. So it may be that the act of hypothetically substituting myself for another or another for me brings us 
to a broader consideration of the reciprocal damage done by violence, the violence, as it were, done to reciprocal social relations themselves. And yet sometimes this very capacity for substituting oneself for another and another for oneself can build up a world that leads to greater violence. How and why is that the case? One reason we cannot or may not take away the lives of those we would rather see gone is that we cannot consistently live in a world in which everyone did the same, Kantian. To apply this measure to our actions means that we have to imagine a world in which we do act that way, set ourselves on the road to action, and query whether there are grounds to stop ourselves. We have to imagine the consequences of murderous action, and that involves passing through a disturbing fantasy, one, I would suggest, that is not altogether consciously orchestrated. For to imagine that the other might die because of me suggests already that the reverse might be true, I might die at the hands of the other, and yet I may well compartmentalize my beliefs so that I imagine my action as unilateral and unreciprocated, which means that I would have become split off from entertaining the possibility of dying at the hands of the other. If one's beliefs are founded on such a denial or such a splitting off, what consequences does that have for how one understands oneself? In performing the thought experiment, one might conclude that others would seek to destroy me, or that they surely will, at which point I may conclude that I'm a damn fool if I do not destroy them first. But on what is that perception of others' intent on destroying me based? Once the thought experiment gives way to those modal possibilities of persecution, the argumentation can work to support the decision to kill. Of course, Freud was not at all convinced that reason has the power to order and constrain murderous wish, a, a remark he made time and again, but especially on the brink of war. And we can see how a form of circular reason, reasoning can function as an instrument of aggression, whether that aggression is desired or feared. Given the reality of destructive urges, Freud argued that ethical severity is surely required at the same time, he wondered whether ethical severity could really do the job. In Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud makes a joke that the ethical severity of the superego, and here I quote, does not trouble itself enough about the facts of the mental constitution of human beings, since in his words, the ego does not have unlimited mastery over the id. Freud claims as well that the commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself, is the strongest defense against human aggressiveness and an excellent example of the unpsychological proceedings of the cultural superego. Earlier, in his reflections on war and death, he writes that no matter how elaborate our rational commitments might be, and here I quote again, in our unconscious we daily and hourly do away with all those who have insulted or harmed us, or again, if we are to be judged by our unconscious wishes, we ourselves are nothing but a band of murderers. Okay. We ought not then to underestimate the power of what he calls the unconquerable dimension of psychic reality, his word for the death drive. Um, although we have focused briefly on the desire to kill and even on what restrains us from killing, we can also see that the death drive operates within political deliberations that are quite dissociated from the toll that they take on human life. We might think about collateral damage as a prime instance of this kind of reasoning, one based on the disavowal that is effectively the instrument through which the destruction happens. We were targeting a certain population. Oh, you know, there's always collateral damage. Those civilians were taken out. The oh, there's always collateral damage is precisely the means through which the justification of collateral damage takes place, right? So there's a structure of disavowal um, that, that is the instrument through which it works. Of course, we can find plenty of evidence of a resistance to legal and political forms of reciprocity, an insistence on the justification of colonial rule, a willingness to let others die through disease or lack of nutrition, or perhaps through closing the ports of Europe to newcomers and letting them drown en masse, even though those bodies may well wash up on the shores of Europe's most coveted resorts. But as well, there is sometimes a contagious sense of the uninhibited satisfactions of sadism, as we have seen in police actions against black communities in the United States, when unarmed black men running away from police are shot down with ease and with moral impunity and satisfaction, as if those killed were hunted prey. 
Or again, the stubborn arguments against climate change by those who understand that by admitting to its reality, they may be forced to limit the expansion of industry and market economy. They know that destruction is happening, but they prefer not to know, and in this way arrange not to give a damn whether or not it happens, as long as they make a profit during their limited time here on Earth. In such a case, destructiveness happens by default. Even if it is never said or thought, there is a I don't give a damn about destruction that gives license to destruction, or perhaps even a sense of satisfactory liberation in opposing checks on industrial pollution and market expansion. We can see as well in the contemporary political life of the United States how many people thrill to the various ways that Donald Trump calls for the lifting of prohibitions against racist policy and action, a lifting of prohibitions against violence, standing, it seems, for, for the liberation of the populace from the cruel and weakening superego represented by the left, and including, which includes, of course, its feminist, queer, and anti-racist proponents of nonviolence. Any position against violence, of course, cannot afford to be naive. It has to take seriously the destructive potential that is a constitutive part of social life. But if we take seriously the death drive, or that late version of the death drive defined as both aggression and destructiveness, then we have to consider more generally the kind of dilemma a moral precept against destruction poses for psychic life. Is this a moral precept that seeks to do away with the constitutive dimension of the psyche? And if it cannot do that, does it have another option besides strengthening the superego and its severe and cruel demands of renunciation? So I tried to explain that there is a Freudian response to this question, which involves the renunciation of impulses, indeed a suggestion that renunciation is the most we can hope for. Uh, we, of course, have to pay the psychic cost of renunciation, but it's well worth paying. The dictum from Freud might be understood this way, murder your own murderous impulse, uh, which is, of course, to keep the murderous impulse alive, but to turn it against itself. Freud develops the idea of conscience in civilization and its discontents along these lines, showing that destructiveness is now directed against destructiveness itself, and because it cannot fully destroy its own destructiveness, it intensifies its operation as a superegoic unleashing. The superego becomes an increasingly cruel psychic mechanism the more intensely it seeks to renounce murderous impulse. At such a moment, aggression, even violence, is prohibited, but surely not destroyed or done away with. It becomes, in fact, uh, the intensity of, of, it gets invested in the intensity of the prohibition itself. In a sense, Freud was asking the question that I'm posing here, what leads any of us to seek to preserve the life of the other? But he was asking that question in a negative form. What, if anything, in psychic life keeps us from doing damage when we are in the grip of murderous wish. Of course, there is an alternative within psychoanalytic thinking, an affirmative way to rephrase that question. What, if anything, in psychic life becomes animated when we actively seek to safeguard the life of another? Returning to the problem of substitution, we can ask that if we can pose the question in another way, how do unconscious forms of substitution come to form what we might call moral sentiments, what conditions the possibility of putting oneself in the place of the other without precisely taking over that place, and what makes it possible to put another in one's own place without precisely becoming engulfed by that other. Such forms of substitution demonstrate the ways that lives are implicated in one another from the start, and this insight gives us a way to understand that whatever ethic we adopt, it finally won't do to distinguish between preserving oneself and preserving the other. Klein, I think, Melanie Klein, makes a psychoanalytic contribution to moral philosophy in her essay, Love, Guilt, and Reparation. There we find precisely in the dynamics of love and hate the site where individual and social psychology converge. Klein maintains that the desire to make people happy is linked with strong feelings of responsibility and concern, and that genuine sympathy with other people, her term, involves putting ourselves in the place of other people, end quote. To do this, identification, her term, brings us as close as we get to the possibility of altruism, 
She writes, and I, qu and I quote, we are only able to disregard or to some extent sacrifice our own feelings and desires, and thus for a time to put the other person's feelings and desires first if we have the capacity to identify ourselves with the loved person. This disposition is not fully self-abnegation, for in seeking the happiness of the one we love, we are understood to share in that person's satisfaction. So there's a vicarious moment that intervenes in the act of putting the other first, such that, and I quote her again, we regain in one way what we have sacrificed in another. This is kind of furtive, furtive selfish satisfaction in, in altruism. In a footnote, she remarks, I would say somewhat urgently, that although she's now focusing on love in this text, she wants to make clear that aggression is co-present, that both aggression and hatred can be productive, and that we should not be surprised to find that people very capable of loving can and do also manifest these other feelings. She makes clear that in giving to others and even in protecting them, we reenact the ways in which we have ourselves been treated by parents or we reenact the fantasy about how we wish we had been treated. She keeps these two options open. She writes, I quote again, ultimately in making sacrifices for somebody we love and in, in identifying ourselves with the loved person, we play the part of the good parent and behave towards this person as we felt at times the parents did to us, dash, or as we wanted them to. She, she, oh, so though she has told us that genuine sympathy is with another is possible and that it involves the ability to understand them as they are and how they feel, it is established through modes of identification that involve what she calls playing a role, even replaying a role within a phantasmatic scene in which one is positioned as the child or as the parent, as they were or as they should have been, which is the same as how one wished they were. In fact, Klein goes on to assert, and I quote, at the same time, we also play the part of the good child toward his parents, which we wish to do in the past and are now acting out in the present. So let us note that in this moment of vicarious identifying, quite central to the effort to make another happy and to give moral priority to that person over ourselves, we are role-playing, in her terms, and reenacting some unmourned losses or some unfulfilled wishes. She concludes the discussion this way, by reversing the situation, namely in acting towards another person as a good parent, in fantasy, we recreate and enjoy the wished for love and goodness of our parents, end quote. This is, I think, the 50s, so you're gonna have to just go with this for a moment. At this point, it's unclear whether we had that good love and then we lost it when we became older, or perhaps we only wished for that good love that we did not really have, or at least that did not really fulfill our wishes. It seems now to matter whether in our vicarious and giving modalities we are actually mourning what we once had or wishing for a past we never had or even experiencing a bit of both. At the point where Klein imports the discussion of aggression, into her text on love, she writes, and I quote, to, but to act as good parents towards other people may also be a way of dealing with the frustrations and sufferings of the past, our grievances against our parents for having frustrated us together with the feelings of hate and revenge to which these have given rise in us, and again the feelings of guilt and despair arising out of this hate and revenge because we have injured the parents whom at the same time we loved, all these, in fantasy, we may undo in retrospect, taking away some of the grounds for hatred by playing at the same time the parts of loving parents and loving children. So a discussion that begins with the assertion that genuine sympathy is possible through modes of identification develops into an exposition how, of how in treating others well and seeking to secure their happiness, we, each of us, replay our grievances against those who did not love us well enough or whose good love we have unacceptably lost. At the same time, according to this logic, one is able now to be the good child one was not, or rather could not possibly have been, given the waves of aggression that overwhelmed all those efforts to be good, those early efforts to be good. So I am, as it were, 
working out my losses and grievances, even expiating my guilt when I engage in genuine sympathy, according to Klein. I put the other first, but my scene establishes all the roles that I or you can play. Perhaps it is all quite easy. I am only sharing in the satisfaction that I give the other because I love the other, and what the other feels, I feel as well. Genuine sympathy. If so, we might well wonder whether the other to whom I give my love is ever free of those scenarios that I replay, reconstituting what I have lost or what I never had, or working out the guilt I have accrued, having sought or seeking still to destroy the other, even if only in fantasy. Is my sympathy motivated by my own loss and guilt, or is it the case that in sharing the other's happiness that I help to bring about, the I and the you are not as distinct as we might have thought if they are sharing? What precisely do they share? When Klein concludes this discussion by claiming that making reparation is fundamental to love, she gives us another way to think about sympathy. Even as I have sympathy for another, perhaps for the reparation that another never received for a loss or for a deprivation. It seems that I am at the same time making reparation for what I never had or how I should have been cared for. In other words, I move toward the other, but I repair myself, and neither one of these motions can be fully extricated from one another. In these passages, Klein focuses on grievance and guilt, but grievance makes sense only in light of the claim that one has been deprived in the past. The deprivation may come in the form of loss, I once had that love and now no longer do, or it may come in the form of reproach, I never had that love and surely should have had such love. Guilt in these passages seems to be linked with feelings of hatred and aggression, whether or not one literally tore at or tore apart the parent, the fantasy is operative, and the child does not always know whether it was a fantasy of destruction or an actual deed. The continuing presence of the targeted parent does not suffice as a living proof that the child is not a murderer, nor apparently is abundant documentation that the deceased parent died by natural causes. For the child, there is this murdered person living on in a more or less inexplicable way, sometimes under the same roof, or sometimes the child is the murdered person inexplicably living on. Kafka's Oderdeck. Indeed, we cannot understand the reparative trajectory of identification without first understanding the way that sympathetic identification, according to Klein, is wrought from efforts to replay and reverse scenes of loss, deprivation, and the kind of hatred that follows from non-negotiable dependency for the relationship of the child to the parent is one of non-negotiable dependency. Klein writes, and I quote, my psychoanalytic work has convinced me that when in the baby's mind, sorry she speaks this way, when in the baby's mind the conflicts between love and hate arise and the fears of losing the loved one becomes active, a very important step is made in development. At issue, of course, is the fact that the fantasy of destroying, say, the mother begets the fear of losing the very one on whom the infant is fundamentally dependent. To do away with the mother would be to imperil the conditions of one's own existence, right? So if the child destroys her, the child is herself destroyed. The two lives are bound up together. There is, writes Klein, in the unconscious mind, a tendency to give her up, which is counteracted by the urgent desire to keep her forever. The baby, of course, is no calculating creature, no utilitarian. There is, at some primary level, a recognition that one's life is bound up with this other's life. Um, uh, we might understand it as a recognition in need. Um, and though this dependency changes form, I would gently suggest that this is the psychoanalytic basis for the theory of social life and that it affects us still in adult life. If we seek to preserve each other's lives, it's not only because it is in my interest to do so, or that I have wagered that it will bring about better consequences for me. Rather, it is because we are already tied together in a social bond that precedes and makes possible both of our lives. So guilt, then, has to be rethought, not so much as mm, the effect of a super-egoic cruelty, um, uh, but rather as a desire to safeguard the life of the other on whom I depend and who is to some degree indistinguishable from me. 
Indeed, when it becomes an act of safeguarding, when guilt turns into the act, the positive act of safeguarding, I am not even sure it should be called guilt at that point. Um, but if we do still want to use that term, we could conclude that guilt is strangely generative or that its productive form is reparation. But safeguarding becomes, I would say, the future directed modality of guilt, a kind of anticipatory care or of looking out for another life that actively seeks to preempt the damage we might cause or let happen. Of course, reparation is not strictly tied to what has happened in the past. It might be undertaken for a damage I only wish to inflict but never did. But safeguarding seems to do something else. It establishes conditions for the possibility of a life to become livable, perhaps even to flourish. It treats another life as a potentially <coughs> grievable life. In this sense, safeguarding is not quite the same as preserving, although the former presupposes the latter. Preserving seeks to secure the life that already is. Safeguarding secures and reproduces the conditions of becoming, of living, of futurity, where the content of that life, that living, can be neither prescribed nor predicted, and where self-determination emerges as a possibility. Klein famously and repeatedly tells us that the infant feels great gratification at the mother's breast. You know, Klein has her own marvelous fantasies and these descriptions of other people's fantasies, so you never quite know. Anyway, this infant apparently feels great gratification at the mother's breast, but also great urges of destructiveness. In the presence of its own aggressive wishes, the infant fears that it has destroyed the object, which, as we know, is the one whom he loves and needs most, and on whom he is entirely dependent, she writes. On whom he is, it's the male child, mother, okay. But this can be generalized and moved out of these particular gender positions. At another moment, the infant is said not only to feel guilt about losing the mother or the one on whom he is most dependent, but also distress, indicating an anxiety that belongs to a felt sense of radical helplessness. In the last analysis, she writes, it is the fear that the loved person, to begin with the mother for her, may die because of the injuries inflicted upon her in fantasy, which makes it unbearable to be dependent on this person. This unbearable dependency nevertheless persists, delineating a social bond that has something unbearable at the core, but that nevertheless has to be preserved. Right? So this is the ethical dilemma, how to preserve something, a, a social bond that has within it an unbearable dependency. Un unbearable enough to give rise to a murderous rage, but one which, if acted out, given the dependency of one on the other, takes down both of them at once. Significantly, perhaps paradoxically, the desire to give to the other, to make sacrifices for her, emerges from this recognition that if one destroys her, one imperils one's own life. The child begins to repair the breach she understands herself to have instigated or imagined, or perhaps repair the breach that is yet to come and to counter destructiveness through repair. If I seek to repair her, I understand myself to have damaged her, or perhaps to have enacted a murder at a psychic level. In this way, I do not disavow my destructiveness, but only to reverse its damaging effects. It's not that destructiveness converts into repair, but that I seek to repair even as I am driven with destructiveness, or precisely because I am so driven. So the psychoanalytic answer to the question of how to curb human destructiveness that we find in Freud focuses on conscience and guilt, instruments that recircuit the death drive, holding the ego accountable for its deeds by a superego that lashes out with absolute moral imperatives, cruel punishments, definitive judgments of failure. But this logic, in which one's destructive impulses are curbed through internalization, seems to find its culminating moment in a self-lacerating conscience or a negative narcissism, as we saw in Freud. In Klein, however, that inversion, we might even call it a negative dialectic, spawns another possibility, which is the active impulse to preserve that other life. Guilt turns out not to be fully self-referential, but rather one way to preserve a relation to another. In other words, guilt can, be, can no longer be understood simply as a form of negative narcissism that cuts the social tie, but rather the occasion for the articulation and preservation of that very bond. Klein thus gives us a way to understand 
um, importantly, the way that guilt marshals the destructive impulse for the purpose of preserving the other and myself, an act that presupposes that one life is not thinkable without the other. For Klein, this inability to destroy the one life without destroying the other operates at the level of fantasy. And although the developmental account presumes infant and mother, can we not say that this ambivalent form of the social bond takes a more general form once the interdiction against murder becomes an organizing principle of social life? After all, that primary condition in which survival is ensured through an always partially intolerable dependency does not exactly leave us as we age. Indeed, it often becomes more emphatic as we age and enter into new forms of dependency that recall the primary ones, entering into housing and institutional arrangements accompanied by caregivers if they exist. We see how, or we saw rather, how in the consequentialist scenario, each of us concludes that it's really not in our best interest to go about killing those for whom we feel antipathy or emotional ambivalence, since then others who feel antipathy toward us may well get the idea and decide to take one's own life or the life of another, and then we wouldn't be able to universalize any rule governing that mode of conduct without jeopardizing the very rationality that distinguishes us as humans and that constitutes the world as habitable. In different ways, whether consequentialist or Kantian, each of these positions elaborates a scenario in which we are asked to duplicate or replicate our actions, imagining others in our position or projecting ourselves into the positions of others, and then to consider and evaluate the action we propose in light of that experiment. For Klein, however, we are from the start and quite without deliberation in a situation of substituting ourselves for another or finding ourselves as substitutes. That reverberates throughout adult life. I love you, but you are already me, carrying the burden of my unrepaired past, my deprivation, and my destructiveness. And I am doubtless that for you, taking the brunt of punishment for what you never received, we are for one another already faulty substitutions for irreversible pasts, neither one of us really getting past the desire for repairing what cannot be repaired, and yet here we are, hopefully sharing a decent glass of wine. <laughs> okay, hopefully. Okay. Life, life as we know it, Freud tells us, in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, is too hard for us. Thus, the need for various forms of narcosis, including, of course, art, carrying the burden of ungrievable loss, of intolerable dependency, and irreparable deprivation, we seem to be in what we call our relationships, spinning out scenarios of need of repair and seeking to repair through forms of giving. It is perhaps a persistent dynamic in which polarity, such as giving and receiving, or safeguarding and repairing, are not always distinct. Who is acting is not always separable from who is acted upon. Perhaps this kind of morally and sensuously fecund ambiguity constitutes us in a potentially common way. If my continuing existence depends upon another, then I am here separated from the one on whom I depend, but also quite crucially over there, ambiguously located here and there, whether in feeding or sleeping or being touched or held. In other words, the separateness of the infant is in some ways a fact, but in significant ways a struggle, a negotiation, if not a relational bind. There is always some measure of distress and lack of gratification, no matter how good the parenting, since that other body cannot be there at every possible moment. So hate for, hatred for the ones upon whom one is intolerably dependent is surely part of what is meant by the destructiveness that invariably surges forth in relations of love. How then does this translate into a more general principle, one that might lead us back to the questions of what keeps us from killing and what leads us to preserve the life of the other? Could it be that even now in destroying another, we are also destroying ourselves? If so, it is because this I that I am has only ever been ambiguously differentiated. I am one for whom differentiation is a perpetual struggle and problem. Klein and Hegel seem to converge here. I encounter you, but encounter myself there as you, reduplicated in my disrepair. And I myself am not just me, but a specter I receive from you, searching for a different history than the one you had. The I lives in a world in which dependency is not eradicable without eradicating its own self. 
Some abiding truth of infantile life continues to inform our political lives as well as the forms of dissociation and deflection out of which fantasies of sovereign self-sufficiency are born. This is one reason why Jacqueline Rose has suggested that if we want to avoid going to war, we should hang on to forms of derision and failure that preempt or undercut forms of triumphalism. We may think that genuine sympathy requires that I understand myself as quite separate from you, as not you, but it may be that my capacity not to be me, what Klein calls playing a role, even to act out, is part of what I am and do, and also what allows me to sympathize with you. And this means that in identification, I am partly comported beyond myself in you, and what you levy in my direction is carried by me. So there is some way we are lodged in one another. I'm not only the precipitate of all those I have loved and lost, but the legacy of all those who failed to love me well, as well as the ones I imagined to have successfully kept me away from that intolerably early distress over my survival and that unbearable guilt over my rage. And I endeavor to become the one who seeks to secure the conditions of your life and to survive whatever rage you feel about a dependency you cannot flee. Indeed, we all live more or less with a rage over a dependency from which we cannot free ourselves without freeing ourselves from the conditions of social and psychic life itself. So to, to conclude then, let me return briefly to this idea of lives as equally grievable. Um, I want to suggest um, that if all lives are considered equally grievable, the political world ought rightly to be organized such that this principle is affirmed in the governance of economic and institutional life, and that this would involve an anticipatory safeguarding um, of lives against the destruction of which we ourselves are capable. There is, some t there is something different from protecting the vulnerable by strengthening forms of paternalistic power. After all, that strategy always arrives late and fails to address the differential production of vulnerability. If a life from the start is regarded as grievable, then every, any, every precaution will be taken to safeguard such a life against its harm and destruction. Of course, it's notoriously difficult to get the message across that those who are targeted or abandoned or condemned are also grievable, that their losses would or will matter and that the failure to preserve them will be the occasion of immense regret and obligatory repair. What disposition, then, allows us to establish the anticipatory powers of regret and remorse such that our present and future actions might forestall a future we will come to lament? In Greek tragedy, lament seems to follow rage and is usually belated, but sometimes there is a chorus, some anonymous group of people gathering and chanting in the face of propulsive rage, who lament in advance, mourning as soon as they see it coming. Thank you.